Well, uh, in 2006, when the scandal broke, um, when the New York Times lowered the curtain on J.T. Leroy, uh, I had no idea what a J.T. Leroy was. So I had never uh, read the books. Uh, and nor did I even hear the scandal when it was breaking. So a few years later, a, a friend of mine, a journalist named Paul Cullum, uh, he knows I like truth is stranger than fiction stories. And I'm always, I'm always looking for a good story. And he said, you should check this out. This might be up your alley. And the scandal had generated such a massive amount of ink. And I read it all. And there was one voice glaringly missing. That was the voice of the author uh, on and off the page, Laura Albert. She had held her story back. And I said to myself, wow, I would love to hear her tell this story. And I also had this feeling that there was just much, much more to the story than was being told. And it was just a feeling I had. So I sent her uh, my film, The Devil and Daniel Johnston, which for anyone here who perhaps has not seen it, uh, deals very vividly with the intersection of madness and creativity. And those themes really spoke to her. This is obviously a, a story that involved madness and creativity. And then she decided she would share her story with me. And uh, I learned that other documentarians, Hollywood had approached her over those years, and she'd said no to everyone. But because of uh, The Devil and Daniel Johnson, we started to go down this road together. I can uh, see how that particular approach to this material uh, really wasn't necessarily intuitive, but uh, after the fact, seems uh, like you shouldn't tell the story any other way. Um, and one aspect of that in particular that uh, really grabbed me was the uh, tape recordings of the phone conversations, which is something that is really unusual and fascinating because the character of JT Leroy was so much formed through those conversations and through the relationships that this fictional character had with real people. Um, and uh, I wonder what the process of working with those tapes was like. How did, how did they come to exist? Did, sure. did you have open access to them? Well, very simple. Um, the Devil and Daniel Johnson also was filled with audio recordings. Um, and it, it's just a fact. And um, Daniel was an amazing self-documentarian. He saved everything. So that film is just filled with Super 8 millimeter and old drawings and hundreds of photos and lots of audio recordings. It's just incredible, and, and that, that was a big archive. When I reached out to Laura, I, of course, could have no idea that she had anything, let alone maybe a single photograph. It was unknown to me. So it was, I don't know, it, a coincidence, but a good one, that she was also an incredible self-documenter. These are people who, for whatever reason, they're both artists, absolutely were devoted to documenting their lives. And so she had saved everything, um, thousands of photos, actually. Her mom was a huge scrapbooker. I had audio, as you hear her young girl voice, she was recording since she's in the group home when she's age 15. That was a quarter-inch reel. She was taping herself. And as I came to learn, she, her, because of her hotline addiction, which she also had with her food addiction, she had been making these calls as boys since she was a young girl. And she told me, quote unquote, you know, she never knew where the story was going to go and or if a story would last a day, a week, or a month. And that was all fiction, almost like writing off the page. So this documentation of taping and saving everything was just something that this person did. And obviously... It gave me the opportunity to create, just like with Devil and Daniel Johnson, a very immersive experience. Because even when I was, I, when I knew nothing of this film or subject, it was always like, "Well, how did this happen?" And for seven years, and, and I think you indicated that, how, or even longer, like ten or thirteen years, like it happened very simply because of the phone. The phone that doesn't know, you know we didn't we don't have um, FaceTime or iChat or whatever you want to call it now back then so you could hide behind the phone and that's exactly what it was a phone and a fax so therefore 
the phone was very important in this story, and it's just I was able to put you on the phone. There's a great film called Deep Water about the yacht race around the world. And it's a huge deception. The guy decides to like duck out of the yacht race, hang out in South America, rejoin the race, and maybe win. Well, in the middle of that huge deception, he is bolexing himself and recording the whole journey. So when you're watching that film, you're on the boat. And I love that. And that's what happened with Daniel's materials, and that's what I tried to do with Laura's materials. So. Uh, can, does the audience have any questions? We can throw it out to them. Hello. Uh, she raised the issue um, that people have said that she had um, dissociative disorder or multiple personalities. Would you care to comment on that? Um, what I tried to do was what was factual that I know. She was absolutely institutionalized multiple times in the nursing home, and that was also in the, uh, the court transcripts when she was sued. So those were real mental hospitals right here in New York as well as the group home. I do not know her diagnosis. I just know what she says in the film that it is not multiple personality disorder. At the same time, to quote Laura, she has the roadmap to crazy. Hey, Harry. Was it um, was it difficult to get inside to her? I mean, you know, obviously she's very she's on the screen. She's very frank. That's a one on one interview with you. She's bearing her soul and telling her story for the first time. I presume that didn't just happen when you guys went to go shoot her. There must have been something that led up to that. A series of phone interviews. How did she get comfortable with you? What happened was when I got permission. It still took three years to get the funding. So we were in contact with basically, did you get the funding? No, I didn't get the funding. I'm going to go make the real Rocky right now. It was that kind of thing. So I was not able to really start until the funding came in. And then when it happened, I did six months of deep research. And then we went and did eight days in a row, which is very, very long. I've never done eight days before. And what I, I could not know how it was going to go. I planned for it to be great, hoping it would be great. And that's why I, I did that background for her. And that's why I broke the fourth wall. And that was a very expensive shoot versus some of the other standard talking head shoots. So I invested in this shoot. But she came to share because she really wanted to now tell. She was ready. And what I found is what ended up on the screen. Nothing was off the table. And she came to share and she shared everything, including what I call the saga of J.T. Leroy, all of her deceit. She's telling you she's speedy. She's doing the British accent. Then she's J.T. Anything, you know, in this tale she shared openly, including the unknown to me, uh, the tragic backstory element. So it was, a, it was a fascinating experience, but there was no pre-interview or anything like that. She, she's a storyteller, and she wanted to tell. This was her chance. She, you know, she, there have been so many articles saying, you know, we've heard other perspectives before, but now she wanted her perspective out there. So that's why it's, you know, I'm proud that it's a subjective film, very much like The Kid Stays in the Picture, um, James Toback's Tyson, uh, The Fog of War, The Unknown Known. I, you know, it's a choice, and I, I, I like that choice. Is that Linda? Yeah. Hey. Yeah, it's just great. I don't have any questions. Oh, well, Linda Hansen's here. Just, you know, Linda Hansen is so awesome. When I was really, really young, she actually cared about me as a young filmmaker and worked really hard to try to get me funding and couldn't have been more supportive of my first film, which my cinematographer, Fortune Procopio, is sitting here in the audience who shot all of my films except this one. And you helped us. It, was, it just meant a lot that you actually cared. So thank you, Linda. And I still do. Well, I know you do. But seriously, you were awesome then and you're awesome now. It meant, it meant so much to me when I was starting out. Uh, I, I always have questions. Sure. Um, I think the issue of whether this is deception is an interesting one to me. Mm -hmm. And 
um, I wonder if you have an opinion on this. I don't know if I understand exactly your question. Um, it, what is deception? I'm sorry. She said, "I my hearing of it mm -hmm. is that she resented people saying that she was deceiving people because these seemed so much a part of her and a part of that she was." I mean, I don't. Even know. I think I know what you're trying to say. The line that that I think you're referring to, of course, is when she, she was labeled a hoax. Exact. Thank you. I know what you're saying. Um, that is uh, too simplistic a word that she, as you can see in the film, does not like and does not feel is correct. Um, at the same time, the film clearly shows it was a very organic journey that lasted so many years, and it was filled with deceit, as sh she tells and shows you. But it it's impossible to pre-plan 13 years of your life. You know, Savannah in a hat and wig is many years later than actually writing balloons as Terminator. So it's interesting uh, to chew on, I feel. That, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, please. Well, that raises an interesting question about the chronology of the film, and I wonder how much of that came out of sort of the way in which you uh, interlay the story of JT Leroy with the story of Laura Albert. Sure. And is, does, did that come out of the interview process or was that uh, sort of an interpretive choice? Well, both. I mean, interpretive isn't the right word though. Very simply, A, I wanted to figure, it's a very complicated story. So there was two goals. A, let's figure out how to clean and clearly tell the saga of JT Leroy from in a very linear fashion, because that's the job. B, the unknown known to me, who is Laura Albert? There's no such thing as Laura Albert. And I always found, through The Devil and Daniel Johnston, how important backstory was. The Devil and Daniel Johnston's whole first act is a super eight millimeter backstory where you really learn about fundamentalist Christianity, all the stuff that went on, initial mental illness. And I saw the power of learning about that before he's a fully formed artist in Austin, Texas, where perhaps another filmmaker would start the story. And I hoped that Laura Albert's backstory would reveal deep truths, and, and it turned out it did. Therefore, I then had material to take her Super 8 movies, and in this case, each one was an epiphany. So you have learning that, you know, for instance, well, multiple institutionalizations. Okay, that's important. Um, but these behaviors of calling a phone as a young boy, like I found her young girl notebooks, which had pages and pages of hotline telephone numbers. This is a deep addiction that she was ashamed of. And in the margins were hundreds of little boy-girl doodles. This is when she's very young. I animated those boy-girl doodles, and that's her handwriting. That is like... Amazing, because when you get to the phone call, I don't know, 20-something years later, the first call to Dr. Owen in San Francisco, that could literally be the 17,000th call she's made as a boy. She still had the addiction when she was in the group home. The other girls had issues with you know, drugs, alcohol, sex. Her addiction, they had trouble treating because hers was food and phones. And that's what she told me. Anyway... Next one, you learn that she is in the group home and falls in love with the British skinhead Mike and outside of the Who Quadrophenia, probably near here. And she's talking British and gets into a relationship with this boy. And she's British for four months, I believe, before the, you know Mike learns they fell in love. And all the girls of the group home are playing along. Well, that is, of course, speedy 20-something years later. So that's amazing to me, right? and hopefully the audience. And the same thing happened with sending her sister out in the punk scene as an avatar. Well, what is that? That, of course, is Savannah. So those, those became structural links to work with, yeah. but I, you know, I couldn't know any of this information. Nobody could. So. Uh, yes, in the back. Why did the sister-in-law agree to do it, and what happened to her in the end? Oh, okay. Savannah Knoop, um, throughout the process of his film, respectfully declined to be in the film. 
Uh, many people did, and I respect that. And about a month and a half before Sundance, I get a phone call, and it's Savannah. She says, I'd like to be in the film. I said, well, I've already made the film. A little late. So my producers and I have a discussion. We said, you know, let's just see what happens. Maybe we can get one line, and it'll be a little surprise in the third act. I got on a plane. I fly to Virginia with a crew. And we get that one, you know, I don't know what she's going to tell me, but she said a beautiful line that was poignant about belief. And that's why she's in the film at all. I mean, obviously she's in the film, but as a sit-down interview, that's how she appeared. And she was, you know, she was super bright, uh, very articulate, and she had her own journey. Um, but that'll be another movie that someone else will make, I suppose. Absolutely. Well, tonight, I don't know what time it is in L.A. right now, but David Milch and Laura Albert are doing this in, in uh, Hollywood on Sunset Strip at the Arclight. So they have a very good relationship. Um, now, what's your approach to him? Uh, did she just like Deadwood? Yeah, well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. It's exactly as you saw in the film that happened with Billy Corgan. Corgan uh, was the first male music artist that she felt uh, talked openly about abuse in his art and his music. And that drew her to him, as you see in the film, and they connected. When she was watching Deadwood, when she tells that story, go to Deadwood, go to Deadwood, she just does it. And she meets him, and, they, and she's right. She's got a different, she's got a spidey, tingly sense. And they connected because he read her books. And it was within one day that she revealed himself to him and he didn't care and he's just like you're a great writer come work with me and then they went on that journey together and he stands by her to this day as a great artist do we have time for more i'm just wondering how much extra footage you had till you decided the route that you were going to go like you know maybe you said that you know a lot of people declined to be in the film did you have a maybe a sense of oh i'm going to do a a post yeah, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it, but the amount of stuff that you had, and then you decided, okay, this is the path I'm going to go. Did you have other possible paths? Or? Well, everything was open because I didn't understand or know the story. So it starts off huge. Devil Daniel Johnson could have been three hours, but you wouldn't. You guys wouldn't sit through it. I promise you. So we no, we found the magic length was an hour fifty. I still believe that. So this film, first of all, this could have been three hours too. I promise you but nobody's going to sit through it. So I, I had a cut that was two hours and 10 minutes, and I'm watching test screenings, and people, you know, this thing's dragging, even though it's great. I, I made the decisions. I cut a few scenes that were great scenes. But you know what? The movie wasn't great until it landed and hit. And you know what? This film's the same magic length. That's my magic number, hour 50. So I don't want people looking in at their watch or, buying popcorn or having to go pee. So you, you want to just, you want to nail that. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking Chip. Right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. <laughs>